Welcome to Lesson 6a, Gaussian Plumes Simplified. Last time we derived the general Gaussian plume diffusion equation. Today we're going to simplify it, and then we're going to apply boundary conditions and solve it. So review from last time, we have a source strength, which was a singularity right at the origin. The plume diffuses in the vertical direction. That's from the side view. You can see it diffusing this way. And then from the top view, it's diffusing in the y direction that way. So we expect that there's a Gaussian shape. In fact, mathematically, this will turn out to be a Gaussian when we solve it. So you have a Gaussian in both the y and the z directions. And then it just diffuses. So the Gaussian spreads out and the magnitude in the middle gets smaller. But these are all represented by the same equation. It's a Gaussian curve, as we'll find out. In this case, we're assuming no buoyancy because this plume, just as soon as it is created as a singularity right at that origin, it just starts spreading horizontally in the x direction and in the y direction into the page. And this is x this way. Last time we derived this equation, we are going to now simplify it. And I'll start numbering these equations for consistency when I refer to them. This will be equation one. Now we're going to do some assumptions and approximations to simplify this equation one as much as possible. First thing is it's steady. All right, so there's no changes with time. So that means any term with time goes away. So that guy, uh, term one, goes away. The next thing is we're going to assume that u is a constant everywhere. So we're going to ignore the changes of the boundary layer, for example. Just assume it's just a constant speed everywhere. So since u is a constant, it comes outside of this derivative. It's not a function of x or anything else, so we can bring it outside the derivative. The third approximation or assumption is that advection, okay, remember that's what some people call convection, the advection term, advection in the x direction is much, much greater than diffusion in the x direction. So the advection term dominates since there's a capital U and this plume is moving along. C changes very slowly. We can, we're can we talking about miles with some of these plumes. And the diffusion in x is very, very slow compared to advection, just the fact that it's moving in the x direction. So the diffusion term in the x direction is this term 3. So that whole term can go away because term three is much, much less than term two. And then we'll make another one. We'll assume that these diffusion coefficients, dAjy and dAjz, are functions of x only. So both of the remaining diffusion coefficients, dAjy and dAjz, depend on x, but they do not depend on y or z. So when we look at the equation term four here, this is a derivative with respect to y. This daj is only a function of x, so it can come out. And this one is only a function of x, so it can come out since there's a z there, not an x. So that simplifies terms four and five. One note or comment here, and that is that dajy and dajz are not the same in general. They're generally different from each other. These plumes are generally turbulent. And so normally we'd say, well, that means that the diffusion coefficients for turbulent flow, even between like mass and energy and momentum are all the same. Well, that's true in general, but when there's atmospheric conditions like with lapse rates, then you have stability or instability in the z direction, whereas there's no temperature gradation, no temperature variant in the horizontal direction. So the bottom line is that these two diffusion coefficients will not be the same as each other at any given x, and they will vary with x and with atmospheric conditions. So the only exception to that is if, like, for example, here I show it diffusing more rapidly in the horizontal direction from the top view than in the side view. So this one is a somewhat stable, I'd call this mildly stable kind of atmosphere. If the atmosphere were exactly neutral, then you'd have a coning plume, and the coning plume would have these two identical diffusion rates. And in that case, DAJY and DAJZ would be identical. But in general, they are different from each other. So that's the point I wanted to make. So when we put these four assumptions and approximations back into equation one, we get the simplified Gaussian plume diffusion equation. Equation one reduces to this form of the equation. Again, you can go back and see everything I did, got rid of that third term, and then I moved a lot of stuff out of the derivatives, and I got rid of term one, the unsteady term. So this is all we have left. 
So that's a much simpler equation. So I just call it the simplified Gaussian plume diffusion equation. Normally, when I teach this live, I now ask the students in the class, how many boundary conditions do we need to solve equation two for our unknown variable, which is cj. cj is a function of x, y, and z in this plume, in this particular equation. So mathematically, how many boundary conditions do we need? Well, to answer this question, we need to look at the equation. This differential equation has a number of mathematical descriptions. First of all, it's second order. How do I know it's second order? Well, you look at the orders of the derivatives. Here's a first order term. Here's a second order term. Here's a second order term. So the highest order in any of the variables is the order of the equation. So it's second order. It's actually first order in X here, but it's second order in Y and second order in Z. So we generally would say it's a second order equation overall. And then it's also linear. How do I know it's linear? Well, the coefficients, these d's here and this u, use just a constant, these d-a-j-y and d-a-j-z, we said they are functions of x, which is fine. They can be functions. All these coefficients can be functions of x, y, or z, and it's still linear. When it's nonlinear, if these guys, this d was a function of cj, the unknown, the variable that's the dependent variable, or if this guy was a function of cj or u was a function of cj, then it would be nonlinear. So this is linear, and it's a PDE, a partial differential equation, and that's because CJ is a function of more than one variable. So it's a second order linear partial differential equation. So how many boundary conditions do we need? Well, you should have learned this somewhere along the line, but just for a quick review of your math, you need one boundary condition for every order of every variable. Let me just first count them up. We need one for X because there's a first order in X. We need two for Y because it's second order in Y, and we need two for Z since it's second order in Z. The answer is five. We need five boundary conditions in order to solve this problem. So just summarizing here, one in X since it's first order in X, two in Y, and two in Z. And so now we need to actually find what these boundary conditions are. Let's examine our plume and decide what boundary conditions we have. So our plume looks something like this. It's spreading. And this could be in either the Y or the Z direction. And then we have at any X location. So this is X in this direction. We have some Gaussian shaped plume where we're plotting CJ as a function of Y or Z. So what are our boundary conditions? Well, two of them are very easy, and that is we know that as we go out to infinity, we have CJ going to zero. So our first boundary condition is that CJ goes to zero as Y goes to infinity. And then if we look at the Z direction, this would be a top view for Y. If it's a side view for Z, we have exactly the same kind of boundary condition. That is CJ goes to zero as Z goes to infinity. Now for number three and four, you might say, well, we also can claim that C goes to infinity when Y goes to negative infinity, but this is a symmetric problem. It's the Gaussian symmetric, so that doesn't really help you. It would be better to do a different kind, and we're going to say instead, when Y or Z is equal to zero, right along the center line of that plume, then it's a maximum. CJ reaches a maximum. Mathematically, we express that as a derivative. So for number three, we're going to say del cj del y equals zero at y equals zero. And remember, these are partial derivatives with dels, not d's, because this is a PDE, a partial differential equation. So that's our third boundary condition. And similarly, the fourth boundary condition is the same except in z, because again, this plot can be in either y or z. I didn't just draw both of them. So what have we done? We've got four boundary conditions now. We've done two for Y and we've done two for Z. So all that's left is this one for X. Now, what are we going to do with that? Well, if you go back to the origin, remember we had a singularity right there where we have M dot JS is our source and that is a point singularity. Can we say CJ equal infinity at X equals zero? That doesn't work. That is not valid because then you just have infinite everywhere and you can't specify infinite boundary condition there. You wouldn't be able to solve the problem. What a bummer, dude.
we have to do something a little more clever. And so what we have to think about is that all of the mass that's introduced at this singularity starts being swept downstream due to the wind. It's also diffusing, so it spreads out. But whatever mass flow rate, this is a mass per time, mass flow rate that comes out of the top of the stack as our point source, that same amount has to cross any X plane. So all the mass of the air pollutant emitted goes downstream in the plume. There's nowhere else for it to go. It diffuses, it spreads out, but it moves downstream. So no matter where you are downstream, whatever was produced here has to be crossing through any cross-sectional area that I draw there. And so let me draw this in 3D and try to illustrate this a little bit better. Here's my attempt at a 3D view of this plume, X, Y, and Z axis shown. And we're going to take some cross-section here. So in cross-section, this is going to look like an ellipse. And so this will be at some downstream location, X1. And then take another cross-section here at some downstream location, X2. And so if I put hash marks there, these are, this is just a, a plane. It's just an ellipse, basically, an ellipse that crosses through, passes through the plane. Looking straight from the top, it would just look like a line, but it's actually an ellipse in this three-dimensional view. And the point is that whatever mass flow comes out here, this m dot js, the same mass flow rate, m dot js, has to pass through any cross-sectional area m dot j s through x1 and through x2. So let me formalize that here. m dot j1 or m dot j2, those have to equal m dot j s as I showed here at any x location, x1 or x2, m dot j1, m dot j2 must equal m dot j s, in fact, at any x location. So in other words, this m dot j s is just a constant. Whatever mass comes out of the plume at the source has to be the same mass flow rate that goes through any cross-sectional area for any x greater than zero. Of course, x less than zero, there's nothing there. So any x greater than zero. So let me just write this out a couple different ways. Make sure you understand this. All the air pollution does, the air pollution is our BCs J. That's the air pollution that we're talking about. All the air pollution does is diffuse in the Y and Z directions. And advex, it diffuses a little bit in the X direction, but we're ignoring that. It advex into uh, the X direction. So that's one statement here. And then another statement, another way of saying that, is the air pollution mass flow rate does not increase or decrease as you go downstream. It can't. The plume is swept downwind. All that it does is diffuse. So m dot j is constant at any x location. And that constant, of course, is m dot j s, that we called it at the source. So those are two ways to think about what's happening here. Now, mathematically, let's go back, not lose sight of what we're doing. We still need our fifth boundary condition. So now let me write our fifth boundary condition. We need one for x. What we're going to do is create an integral. We're going to say we have to integrate from minus infinity to infinity in the z direction. This is a double integral. Then y goes from minus infinity to infinity in the y direction. We have to come up with a formula here that will give us m dot j. Well, if we have a U, a capital U, and a CJ, and then a DY, DZ, that will give us mass flow rate. And we're going to specify that as equal to m dot j s, which is a constant because that's how much we're putting into the air in the first place, right at the top of the stack. And what is dy and dz? What we're actually doing is we're going up here and at some slice here where we're talking about, we take a little area, a little element dA, and that area, if I blow it up, magnify it, this will have dimensions of dz and dy in this coordinate system. And any x slice, we take that area and we integrate over y and integrate over z, and we get this final boundary condition. Finally, we're ready to solve this. So here's our equation, call that equation two, our simplified equation. We have five boundary conditions, and then we have to solve it. And I'm gonna put my squiggly, if I had more room, I'd put a longer squiggly because this involves a lot of algebra, a cold, rainy night, that you wanna solve this. Those of you who like math can solve that equation, but you don't have to because I solved it for you, fortunately. And this is the final solution then. We're gonna actually simplify that a little bit more next time, but this is the solution. So this is the Gaussian plume equation. We still haven't added buoyancy or anything. 
But notice the Gaussian behavior. These are Gaussian type terms, which is what we want, because anytime you see an exp with something to the negative and some variable squared in it, that's typically a Gaussian type of a equation. So this is our solution. We'll call that equation three, our Gaussian plume equation. Then we'll do some examples of how to use that in the next several lessons. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.